The Night Beat starts right now. Just one month from today, the children of Uvalde will be heading back to school. Of course, some families still feeling pretty hesitant after the way the last school year ended. Today, a group out of Houston hosted an event at the El Progreso Library. The organizers tell the night team's Lee Waldman their goal is to help them feel more ready. Dancing, laughter, smiles all fill the El Progreso Library Saturday afternoon. Joy and pain can't live in the same heart, so we have to balance that, that we can have those moments of laughter and happiness, but then on the, ver on the opposite side of that, we uh, acknowledge there are times that we do have to address the sadness, but it's not all sad. We just learn how to manage both. Dr. Yvonne Clark, director of It's Okay to Cry Children and Adolescent Grief Center outside of Houston, worked to organize this event to help kids and their parents address their feelings ahead of a new school year. Having this kind of a fun activity, but still supporting emotional distress, the sadness, and the, um, the heartache and pain that they've experienced would be a good way to kind of be that catalyst to get ready to go back to school. Kids did play therapy, got free school supplies, and met superheroes. Outside, spirit cookers are serving up smiles. So many of them have such a big heart. I mean, I, I see that the sad part about it, but I've seen the positive today from some of these families that lost family members, and they said, Thank you so much for coming and be a part of this. Kimberly Morgan and Eddie Garcia brought these portraits of the 21 victims from Pflugerville she created. Garcia went to Rob when he was younger. The connection is huge. Um, it was tough. It still is. I um, don't know any of them, but the connection hurts. Processing that pain with the moments of joy is what this is all about. Lee Waldman. KSAT 12 News. And Lee tells us a plate sale that was held earlier today raised over $9,000. Just a reminder, there are counseling services available at the Uvalde Together Resiliency Center that is located at the County Fairplex down there. They are open Tuesday to Friday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tonight, the principal of Robb Elementary holds a new position within the school district. Uvalde CISD announced in a press release yesterday, Mandy Gutierrez will be the assistant director of special education. The press release says the reassignment fulfills her desire to support special education students across the district. Gutierrez's position will be filled by Christy Perez. Perez previously worked as the assistant principal of Uvalde High School. New on the night beat tonight, the Archdiocese of San Antonio announcing a bishop has died at the age of 90. Bishop John W. Yanta passed away at his home after years of battling serious health issues. The Archdiocese says Yanta continued to be a leader and guided work on a number of endeavors close to his heart despite his health problems. He was born on October 2nd, 1931 and grew up in Runke, Texas. We are still awaiting details on the bishop's funeral arrangements. Tonight, San Antonio Fire is investigating the cause of a fire at an east side home. It broke out around 3.30 this afternoon in the 6100 block of Blind Meadow. Crews say the fire started in the attic of the two-story home. This made it difficult for crews to fight the fire, but after they got to it, they were able to put it out quickly. Fire officials say five people were inside, but they all made it out safely. The cause of the fire believed to be electrical, but arson is still investigating. And tonight, police are searching for the suspect involved in a shooting that left one person dead, another injured. It all happened just before 2 o'clock this morning in the 6500 block of West Commerce Street. San Antonio police say officers found a man lying on the ground in the parking lot with gunshot wounds. He was then taken to a nearby hospital. Another man was found shot on the other side of that parking lot. He was pronounced dead at the scene. One witness says they saw a silver car driving away from that shooting. This is now an ongoing investigation. Well, going to law school or becoming a lawyer remains a challenge for women. They make up less than 40% of attorneys, and Latinas make up only 2% of that. To combat that statistic, St. Mary's hosted the first ever Latina Network Summit. Yeah, it's an effort for Latinas to support each other through pro professional development. The night team's Camelia Juarez introduces us to some of those women. 
I have some hands up here. There's a lot of people, right? I think this event is historical. Attorney Paulina Vera says this is the first time she has seen Latina women in every phase of their law career come together at St. Mary's. It's really amazing and inspiring to see all these women come together to talk about um, the challenges that maybe some of us who are in practice have faced and then imparting that knowledge on learning from your mistakes and knowing that you're not perfect. Vera was a panelist speaking about imposter syndrome, something many first-generation law students like Annalisa Casanova-Smith experience. She says it's challenging to navigate difficult schoolwork and the financial burden. Saying to yourself, like, you're not good enough or maybe I'm not smart enough and really breaking down those barriers within your own mind because you, you don't want to be the thing that holds yourself back. Finding a group of women to relate to changed the game for incoming law student Yessi Anorve Basoria. She says the summit has been eye-opening. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. I have definitely been emotional in some parts, um, just understanding like our background, knowing that I'm not alone, and knowing that you know I am making great connections here. Organizer Brianna Chapa says nearly 150 women attended, and she hopes the connections made today will carry Latinas through their careers. Latinas have a network to fall back upon and a network to lean on and most importantly a network to help uplift and inspire them to continue going within the profession. Vera says her biggest piece of advice for Latinas in their law career is to stay true to themselves. Stay genuine. It can be hard to do that in law school. It can be hard to do that in the legal profession, but your perspective um, is so needed and brings so much value to the profession, so please stay true to yourself. Chapa hopes to provide scholarships next year to help women pay to take their bar exam. And next year, it's unclear when the next summit will be, but we do know that St. Mary's has already agreed to host the next one. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Camelia. Well, today, a nonprofit is helping military families as their children get ready to head back to school. This morning at UTSA, Operation Homefront held its annual Back to School Brigade program. The program is designed to help families of active duty mil military and veterans. At the event, 350 backpacks were given to children before the start of the school year. Typically, families will move locations every three to four years, and every time you have those moves, you incur additional costs reestablishing utilities. So what we're trying to do is just keep a little bit more money in our family's uh, bank account so they can, uh, you know, use it for other things. Over 200 educator kits with supplies for teachers were given to the families as well. The kits are given to children so they can help their teachers out. Not to be undone, Harlandale ISD also hosting a back to school event to get parents and their children ready for the upcoming school year. Take a look this morning at the Harlandale Alternative Center. Families were able to get free school supplies for their children. Today, the district gave away 800 backpacks to those kids. At the event, parents could get their children immunized as well as free haircuts. Having events like this where they can receive uh, free school supplies, free backpacks, you know, just different things to help them out throughout the year. I think it, it means a lot to them and it also means a lot to us that we're able to provide for them. And this is the second year the school district has hosted that back to school bash. You know, it really doesn't feel all that bad outside right now. We've got a bit of a breeze. Temperatures are in the 80s and hey, some of us. Some of us actually saw a little bit of rain. Nice view there of downtown San Antonio. Today, we don't even need to touch the triple digit counter. You know why? We only got up to 97 for the high temperature this afternoon, and we did see a little bit of rain, five one hundredths of an inch of rainfall reported at the airport. Elsewhere, it was 95 in Kerrville, 91 in Rock Springs, 97 in New Braunfels. It did get up to 100, though, out near Del Rio and Catula, but even that is cooler than the last few days. Hey, if you missed out on the rain, we've got another opportunity tomorrow, but again, I got to tamper expectations. Don't get your hopes up. Good news is, though, we should stay below 100 tomorrow. So I'll have that forecast for you. Look at the future cast coming up in just a bit. Still ahead on the night beat, we'll take a look at red flag laws. Despite Texas not having any, there are options to keep guns away from someone believed to be a threat, but it won't be for long. 
Plus, from deadly floods to dangerous heat, a look at the severe summer weather affecting millions across the country. And coming up after this break, the latest on monkeypox here in the U.S., why the demand for the vaccine is quickly outpacing the supply. Those details when we return. Now to the latest on monkeypox in the U.S. Health officials are stressing the importance of getting vaccinated for those who are eligible if they've been exposed. The Biden administration declared it a public health emergency earlier this week to help the federal response. The CDC says about 1.7 million people are now eligible for the vaccine. So far, around 600,000 doses have gone out nationwide. But the demand is now outpacing the supply as more and more people rush to get vaccinated for monkeypox. Seeing it, someone in Georgia have it on her face, I think just seeing the scarring and like the what monkeypox does to you really just made me even more willing to get the shot. The first case of monkeypox was found in the U.S. back in May. Today, there are over 7,500 cases across the U.S. Here at home, Metro Health is reporting 16 total cases of monkeypox in Bear County. Earlier this week, Metro Health received 1,000 doses of the vaccine. Those were given out to six local clinics in the county. To politics now, Senate Democrats are confident they can pass a major part of President Joe Biden's legislative agenda through the upper chamber. According to Senate Democrats, the Inflation Reduction Act would be the largest investment to fight climate change in U.S. history. The bill aims to lower health care premiums and prescription costs as well. It would be paid for by raising taxes on big corporations and the wealthiest Americans. President Biden believes the bill would bring down inflation, but Republicans disagree. Democrats' bill will do nothing to meaningfully cut inflation. Hundreds of billions of dollars in tax hikes on a struggling economy will help, will help kill American jobs. Yesterday's jobs report showed the economy added 528,000 jobs in July. Yet inflation is at a 40-year high despite four interest rate hikes from the Federal Reserve so far. The Fed's still looking at ways to try to control inflation without heading into a recession. Well, I said this on Instagram, but if you didn't see it, when I got to work today, I saw this really weird phenomenon there was like liquid oh. falling from the sky what would that be i know and i had no idea what it was hydro had, meteors yeah That's it might have been a meteor just little ones on my windshield that is the scientific <laughs> word one for of the lucky ones a raindrop today. by the way yeah it's a scientific word is it really yeah hydro meteor oh hydro -meteor. actually that makes sense water falling through the sky i, I was today something. years old when i learned yeah. that Thanks, <laughs> today Sarah. you go you're so smart sarah thank you all right, let's go ahead and take a look at today's isolated rain. Uh, we saw pockets of rainfall out there. Didn't really last all that long for many folks. And with the loss of daytime heating, we've seen the rain come to an end. A few flashes of lightning here and there, but around the San Antonio metro area, again, if you got a shower or a storm, you were very lucky today. Count to yourself uh, lucky. We saw at the airport, the airport was lucky. It got five one hundredths of an inch of rain. Guess what? Five one hundredths of an inch of rain is more rain than we saw for the entire month of July. For the entire month of July, we only saw one one hundredth of an inch of, uh, of rainfall. So yeah, we'll take it. It definitely is not going to help when it comes to the drought conditions for us, but it was nice to just see some rain earlier this morning at four o'clock in the morning. I ran outside to see the rainfall and smell it. It smelled amazing. I wish we could say we were going to get more widespread rain around San Antonio tomorrow, but much like today, we're going to have a few isolated showers and storms. Chance for rain's about 20% tomorrow, and it's especially better along the coastal plain. And then again, once we lose that daytime heating, we're going to be seeing our rain chances come to an end. So only a 20% chance for isolated showers and storms, especially along the coast. Uh, but for us here in San Antonio, it'll be few and far between. Much like today, a little bit of extra cloud cover is going to keep our temperatures from hitting 100 degrees. Tomorrow, I think we'll be close to 98 for the high temperature. But the further south and west you go, we'll probably still get up to 100. 100 in Hondo, 101 in Divine, 101 in Pleasanton, 100 
Hartford and Poteet. Up in the Hill Country, mid a 90s are a good bet, uh, right near 96 in Comfort and in Kerrville, 96 in Bernie and 96 in Bulverde for the high temperature. For your Sunday, here's what you can expect. Sunrise close to 7. It's going to be humid in the morning and, and uh, fairly cloudy too, 77 degrees. Right around noon, we'll still be in the 80s, 88 around noon. And then in the afternoon, 20% chance for an isolated shower storm. Forecasting 98 for the high and the winds will be from the southeast, gusting up to about 20 miles per hour at times. Sunsets tomorrow at 821 and much like tonight, temperatures are going to be in the 80s and it will be breezy. All right, so we have a piece of energy that's moving over the mountains of Mexico right now. It's moving off to the west. This is what allowed for us to see some isolated showers and storms today. That heat high is honestly too far to the north and a little bit weaker to be bringing us record temperatures over the coming days. So we're actually going to stay hot, but at least not record heat out there. And in fact, we'll have a chance for an isolated shower storm tomorrow and on Thursday of this upcoming week. Anywhere you see a 10% chance for rain, that's for a chance for a coastal sea breeze shower. So not good rain chances, no washouts for us. The only thing that would help us out would be the tropics and actually in the tropics, there's something to talk about. For the first time since July 13th, the National Hurricane Center has flagged a tropical wave over Africa that has about a 40% chance of development. Of course, we'll continue to keep you updated on that. We do not want a hurricane. We do not want a hurricane but it would be nice to get a little tropical moisture in here. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that. And coming up in the forecast, I'm gonna show you a neighborhood view of which areas won the Ringfall Lottery today. I was today years old when I realized Tim knew the phrase today years old. I watched the TikToks. <laughs> All right, Andrew, I'm gonna age you. Have you seen uh, <laughs> the movie Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. I have. That's a great yeah. reference. Would you say that the Cowboys have a bunch of Ray Finkels on their team right now when it comes to kickers? Uh, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, I'm not sure where else to take that. I know over the last couple of years, the Cowboys have had some kickers that they've wanted to run out of town. I'm sure they'd rather have Dan Bailey and Greg Zerline this year instead of what they've got on the field. When we come back, we'll hear from Jerry Jones on the Cowboys kicking woes. Plus, local product Terrence Steele is turning heads at camp. Got that too. Next. Look at that, Ezekiel Elliott signing autographs for fans after the Cowboys' lack practice of this weekend. It's time to go camping with KSAT. Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys had one last full padded practice today before taking tomorrow off, and it's always fun to watch the work in the trenches where the real battles take place. Check this out, rookie Tyler Smith and Josh Ball both get, up on the old, get lit up on the O-line. That would have been a sack in live action. On offense, Dak Prescott had two touchdown passes and ran for another. His first TD went to Ezekiel Elliott, and the second was caught by rookie wideout Jalen Tolbert. But the most glaring problem the Cowboys have in camp is their kicking game. No two ways about it, the kickers have been horrible. Former Texas Tech kicker Jonathan Garibay was 4 for 11 today. Does that worry Jerry Jones at all? Oh, not really. I, I want to see. Uh, I know we're challenging them, putting them against the wind out there. Uh, I, I'd like to see them in the calmness of the stadium hitting those 32 yarders, which happens to be the extra point. Let's get that down. Now, on the flip side, no matter where you turn in Cowboys camp, everyone from teammates to coaches is amazed at just how far and how fast Cibolo's own Terrence Steele has developed into a rock-solid offensive lineman. In fact, it looks like he's preparing to take over the right tackle position permanently in just his third season. Greg Simmons has more from California. I love Terrence Steele. I love, you know, just how he's progressed as a, as a player. Just from, I mean, I think he's one of the guys that made the biggest jump from one, year one to year two and, and even uh, into year three. You must be doing something right if you have the Cowboys star running back Ezekiel Elliott singing your praises. You can tell he's just that much more comfortable. He had a great offseason. A dude strong as heck. Uh, and he's kind of kind of come our enforcer out there. The enforcer. Now that's a new term for Cowboys offensive lineman Terrence Steele. The Steele High School product is looking to secure the starting right tackle position in training camp. And he even has the attention of his head coach and offensive coordinator. Terrence is a really physical guy. I think that definitely jumps out to you. Uh, you know, he comes off the ball. He, he's got to be one of the most uh, 
quick, sudden guys off the ball. He's, he's our example so many times on the offensive line of guys just coming off the ball and, and creating contact. The undrafted free agent has already made a significant impact in just his first two seasons in the NFL, starting 27 of 32 games he's played in and is the player to beat for right tackle. With experience, you're going to you know, settle in and uh, find, your, find your groove. So I feel like I'm definitely getting in there and uh, yeah, it is, it's going to be a fun season coming up. Steele is getting his opportunity with Leo Collins being released and latching onto the Cincinnati Bengals and Connor Williams signing with the Dolphins. Did Collins release send a message to Terrence about the confidence the team felt towards him? Yeah, definitely. Who wouldn't? You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I'm just glad I can come in and, you know, and earn their trust. And yeah, I'll just keep working from here. The six foot six, 318 pound steel was asked to reflect on the three days of the draft back in 2020 when his name was never called. And does he use that as motivation for the success he has enjoyed since? Going back to those three days, man, that was a long three days. So I, I keep, I keep that, that pain that I was feeling, and I still apply that to whatever I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, I man, just see how far I came, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I just put the work in. I try to outwork everyone, and this is my, that's what I try to do, and it's paying off. And is it ever? He's already won an award for outstanding off-season workouts, and now it's his job to lose. I always come in thinking I'm the starter, so I mean, that's how I was prepared. That's my, work, my work ethic reflects that. My preparation reflects that. So, I mean, I always feel like I'm the starter, and if you're going to try to take it from me, good luck. The Cowboys will not have any workouts on Sunday. It is a player's day off. As a result, there will only be three more practices before the Cowboys break camp here in Oxnard and head for Denver for shared workouts before facing the Broncos in their first preseason game one week from tonight. With the Cowboys in California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. All right, thanks a lot, Greg. Coming up later in sports, Fernando Tatis Jr. is back in the Alamo City with the missions, but I am now going to head back to the sports department to watch some more early 90s movies to make sure Tim stops throwing guano my direction <laughs> at these teases. That's all I'm going to say. We'll see what we can come up with in the next half hour. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, we'll be right back. It seems to happen after every mass shooting. Somehow people miss a red flag when it comes to the shooter's past behavior. But when it comes to red flag laws, only 19 states have them right now. Texas does not. Some Texas lawmakers who oppose red flag laws have argued that we already have laws that can force someone to give up their gun. So why do we need more? But is that accurate? In this case, that explains Myra Arthur finds out what it takes to remove a gun from someone and just how easy it can be to get it back. We also head to Florida, a state with a red flag law to explain how it works. He made threats of violence and rape, shared a video online depicting a dead animal in a plastic bag, even had the nickname school shooter. Those details about the gunman are findings in a report by the Texas House Committee investigating the massacre at Robb Elementary. All details that surfaced after 19 children and two teachers were murdered. What the shooter did not have was a criminal history or diagnosed mental illness. There's all this conversation about we should have connected the dots. Does Texas have a mechanism that you know of that connects those dots? We have a system where we report individuals to the DPS if they've been committed, um, for example, or if they have a guardian, and that theoretically prevents them from purchasing weapons. But unless you've hit the very tail end of, uh, of that crisis system, unless you're at the end of that whole process, you're under the radar. And Texas has no mechanism to check for it. Judge Oscar Kazin presides over probate court one in Bear County. In addition to wills and estates after someone's death, he also deals with guardianship and emergency apprehension and detention. Both are ways in which someone can be forced to give up weapons under certain circumstances. For someone to be granted guardianship over another person, there must be evidence that person is incapacitated. You can't provide for yourself. You can't take care of yourself. You're so permanently uh, disabled that uh, and incapacitated that you can't provide for your safety, then a person can come in as their guardian. Emergency apprehension and detention is used in cases where someone has become a threat to themselves or others. If somebody is making threatening statements, posts online, is that enough for an emergency apprehension and detention? 
Yes, if the threat is eminent, apparent, and it's related to mental illness, if no law has been broken, but they are a danger to themselves or they're making threats to someone, then an officer can detain them and rather than take them to jail, take them to an emergency room for observation. And at that time, if the person has guns or other weapons on them, law enforcement can confiscate those. But if you are not ultimately committed, law enforcement officers are required to give the weapon back. And that's done without benefit of a hearing. Very few individuals who are detained in Bear County ultimately get committed. Committed to receive mental health treatment. According to the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, over 12,000 people in San Antonio and Bear County were placed under emergency apprehension and detention from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Of those detentions, there were 479 reports of weapons seized. STRAC does not keep track of how many detentions result in commitments. Every day, law enforcement officers come marching into this court and shake their heads and hand me a document where I sign off that the person has not been committed and they have to give them back their weapon. And those law enforcement officers are shaking their heads, why? They just took the gun away from an eminently dangerous individual and they're giving it back without any mechanism to see if it's even the right thing to do. We've empowered people to take action when something bad happens. Isn't the idea that we want to prevent something bad from happening? Bob Gualteri is the sheriff of Pinellas County, Florida, just outside of Tampa. Florida enacted a red flag law in March 2018, just weeks after a shooter gunned down 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. Since then, the risk protection orders afforded by that law have been used nearly 9,000 times in the state, 1,200 times in Pinellas County, the second highest number by county in Florida. Somebody can do something and it doesn't have to rise to the level of being a crime and it doesn't have to rise to the level of being actionable under the mental health statute. In fact, it may not even be mental health related. Somebody just may be a mean, angry person that wants to exact revenge on somebody else, and it may not rise to the level of a crime. If someone in Florida says or does something thought to be a red flag, a report must be made to law enforcement. They investigate and decide whether something needs to be done. Even if it's not actionable uh, from a uh, involuntary mental health standpoint or from a crime standpoint, is there something we should do because this, this person isn't right? Something is wrong here. Gualteri says the case is then reviewed by a supervisor or agency attorneys before proceeding to a judge. We need to make sure, especially with Second Amendment rights and right to keep and bear arms and right to protect yourself, that it is properly vetted. So we have all these steps in place. Law enforcement officer investigates, has to articulate it, supervisory review, agency counsel review, then it goes to a judge. And if a judge determines that there's legal sufficiency, then the judge can issue a temporary order. That temporary order is done ex parte, meaning the person is not present, similar to getting a warrant. The order is good for 14 days, and within those 14 days, a trial is scheduled. That's when the person in question can be represented by an attorney to contest the order. Then a judge makes a ruling. The judge could deny the order or decide that person cannot possess or purchase guns or ammunition for a year. If circumstances change within that year, they can go back to the court and ask the court to reconsider. Once the order expires, Gualteri says there is nothing on a person's record to reflect it. But during the time the order is in place, that person should not pass a background check to buy a gun. And if they already possess weapons, they have to give them up but not necessarily to law enforcement. They can give it to a next door neighbor, they can give it to a family member, they can give it to a friend, or if they want, they could surrender it to law enforcement. So this isn't where cops are knocking on doors and taking people's guns. The sheriff admits this law is not perfect. Someone could turn right around and return the guns to a person who's not supposed to have them, or they could buy guns illegally. He says it's about creating speed bumps along a path to violence. And while red flag laws are often talked about after mass shootings in Pinellas County, it's more commonly used in cases of domestic violence or when someone is threatening to hurt themselves. But everybody talks about prevention. People talk about getting information. People talk about connecting the dots. Well, if you get us all, all this information, and even if you do connect the dots, but you're not doing anything about it, then you haven't accomplished anything. And, and, and you're leaving it open until the next time 
something bad happened. Federal gun legislation signed into law after the Uvalde shooting provides states $750 million to create and manage red flag laws. Top Texas lawmakers have not signaled any interest. It's a tough challenge. How do, how do you ever get to live in a free society where we also get to check all those things when you haven't done anything wrong yet? I don't have the answer, but I'm really tired of watching people who I know were just recently seriously dangerous to themselves getting their gun back without any type of safety net. That was Myra Arthur reporting. If you believe someone you know needs an emergency apprehension or detention, you can call police to request one, ask for a mental health officer to respond, or you could also contact a court directly to ask for a judge's warrant. We have more information on how to do that on our website at ksat.com. This QR code will take you right to that page, KSAT Explains, where you can watch any of our past KSAT Explains segments that we've done. We'll be right back. Millions of people across the U.S. dealing with extreme weather. Everything from dangerous heat to flash flooding is affecting people coast to coast. In California, the National Park Service says around 1,000 people were trapped in Death Valley Park yesterday due to extreme flooding. NPS says parts of the park got over an inch of rain. That's about 75% of all the rain the area gets in a full year. And over in Kentucky, eastern parts of that state are under a flash flood watch again, threatening some of the areas that got hit the hardest during that deadly flooding that hit last weekend. More rain is forecast through midweek, so everybody be weather aware. The ground is already really saturated. On Monday, President Joe Biden and the First Lady are expected to travel to Kentucky to tour the hardest hit areas. They'll meet with Kentucky Governor Andy Brashear and visit the families affected by that devastation. Yeah, it's amazing to see how parts of the nation are dealing with too much rain, and we have a complete lack of rainfall here in San Antonio, although some got a little lucky with a few thunder showers this afternoon. Hey, tomorrow's going to be very similar to today. If you want to enjoy some time by the pool, here's what you can expect. Temperatures will be climbing to 98 tomorrow, so not too hot, but definitely hot. And in the afternoon, we're going to have a chance for an isolated shower or storm. Because we'll have a little bit more cloud cover, uh, the the UV index will be very high, but not extreme. So skin damage time within 20 minutes. Coming up, we're going to show you the future cast of the rainfall potential tomorrow in just a few minutes. Well, welcome back, everyone. You know, we saw a little bit of rain in spots today. Here's a look at the 24 hour radar estimated rainfall across south central texas very streaky in nature only a few saw some rain today mainly across the coastal plain toward victoria and even then only about a tenth of an inch of rainfall here and there let's go ahead and zoom into bear county again if you got rain today you were lucky uh, about a little bit more than a tenth of an inch of rain on the southwest side of town closer to fair oaks ranch we saw in some areas up there maybe about a quarter of an inch of rainfall and out near Shirts, Selma area and up toward Bulverde and Timberwood Park, perhaps about a tenth of an inch of rain. As for the airport, the airport actually recorded some rainfall today. We saw about five one hundredths of an inch of rainfall at the airport and the high temperature today. Not too hot. It was definitely hot, but not too hot. We got up to 97, which is average for this time of year. It's been a long time since we've been able to say that the high temperature was average. Here's a look at the high res future cast again. One or two coastal showers is possible tomorrow, perhaps making a run for that I-35 corridor in the afternoon. Probably not as much rain as we saw today, but still about a 20% chance for some lucky backyards to get a shower or a thunder shower. As a result of the fact that we're going to have a little bit more cloud cover, temperatures should stay below 100 at the San Antonio International Airport. We're forecasting 98 for the high temperature, 96 in Bernie, 96 in Kerrville, 99 New Braunfels, 96 in Bulverde. Some areas, though, will touch the triple digits. Uvalde, Savinal, Hondo, Divine, Pleasanton, uh, and even out 
toward Floresville will be close to 100 degrees tomorrow. All right, your KSAT 12 hour forecast just to recap everything for you. A stray shower is possible in the morning. We're like a sprinkle. It's going to be humid and in the 70s we will be at 83 by 10, 88 by noon, and it's in the afternoon that we introduce that 20% chance for an isolated shower storm. Once again, 98 for the high temperature southeast winds at about 15 miles per hour. That low pressure system that brought us the isolated rain today is moving off to the east, but it's preventing the heat high from developing in a big way over south central Texas. So in the coming days, we're going to have some chances for rain here and there. Isolated tomorrow uh, and isolated on Thursday with a few coastal showers possible by about Monday. Let's take a look at that seven day forecast over the next seven days. We'll be near 100. At least we won't be dealing with record heat. Sounds good to me, <laughs> as long as it's not 100 or over. Thanks. All right, Andrew, back to work for the Roadrunners. That's right, and it's a big deal that Brendan Brady is still a Roadrunner. He was contemplating not playing this upcoming season, and he eventually decided to come back, which is huge for that road run, uh, for that running back core. When we come back, we'll hear from Brady on his decision to return to the UTSA. Plus, Renato Tatis Jr. returns to the Alamo City. Got that too next. First week of fall camp is in the books for the UTSA Roadrunners and head coach Jeff Trailer is thankful to still have senior running back Brendan Brady on the team. After four years with UTSA, Brady was initially ready to move on from football, but with star running back Sincere McCormick now in the NFL and some significant injuries to the remaining young backs on the roster, the running back room was pretty depleted. That left an opening for Trailer to come in and coax the steal alum back to UTSA for one last ride. Coach Trailer, he actually went to my high school and recruited and my mom works in the athletic department over there and so you know obviously he talked to my high school coaches and he talked to my mom and you know was just saying that he wasn't going to give up on me coming back and so he called me um a little bit after that um and was just basically talking to me saying like you know he, he wants me to come back he thinks he can miss what i had to offer and he called me with the opportunity and i was like you know i'm gonna regret this if i don't play um and i'm gonna regret if i can't can't come in and help the team um and that opportunity presented itself so i just had to jump on it Brady is one of eight returning offensive starters for the defending Conference USA champions. Meanwhile, at UIW, the Cardinals have wrapped up their first week under new head coach G.J. Kenney. Under former head coach Eric Morris, Incarnate Word established themselves as one of the teams to beat in the FCS and advanced the second round of the playoffs last year. Wide receiver Taylor Grimes was a big part of that success. What does he think about the Cardinals now that Kenney's leading the way? Nothing's really changed here. Uh, you know, Coach Morris did a good job last year, and then Coach Kenny has done a great job bringing in a new staff and, and new players and, and keeping the same core group of guys, and uh, he's, just, he's just done a great job. UIW opens their season at home against Southern Illinois on September 3rd. The Astros enter tonight a half game behind the Yankees for the top spot in the American League, taking on the Guardians on the road. But Houston starts tonight's game on the wrong foot. Bottom of the second, two on. Ahmed Rosario drills a line drive to center field. Miles Straw and Andres Jimenez both come in to score, and Cleveland leads 4-0. Astros get a run back in the top of the ninth, but that's all they get. Houston falls 4-1. At least Tim's a happy camper. Meanwhile, the Rangers are looking to bounce back from a tough loss last night against the White Sox. Game three of a four-game series. Pick this one up in the bottom of the seventh with the bases loaded. Adelise Garcia blows this one wide open with a double to left center. That'll clear the bases to make it 7-0 Texas. And the Rangers cruise to a big win, 8-0. Check out the line outside Wolf Stadium tonight to see Fernando Tatis Jr.'s return to the Alamo City. The Padres sensation began a rehab assignment with the missions to recover from a wrist fracture fracture that he suffered prior to the start of the MLB season. Before he took the majors by storm, Tatis played more than 100 games for San Antonio as a member of the missions from 2017 to 2018. And returning to the Wolf was a cool experience. A lot of memories over here, a lot of memories, a lot of tears, a lot of blood, <laughs> however you want to call it. Um, it was a feel that it was one of those that shaped me really well and uh, you know, glad I can be back here. Tatis didn't give an exact timetable on his return to the majors, but by all accounts, he should be back in the Padres lineup before the end of the month. But it was not a huge night for Tatis at the plate. He drew a pair of walks and struck out in three at-bats as a DH leading off. Missions fall to the Wichita wind surge 5-1. He and the missions are back in action tomorrow, I believe. You can imagine that the crowd is still going to be just as big. Yeah, I love to see those big leaguers play. Yeah. I appreciate the Cleveland highlight. Anything that doesn't involve the Browns dumpster fire, I'm all about. <laughs> Thank you.
It's, it's the least I can do after your references earlier in the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. With that, we'll be right back.